Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. OK, so welcome, everyone, to Digital Age Expo. Uh, just before I hand over to our guest speaker, I just wanted to make you aware that we are recording the session for those of you that are unable to make this specific time slot. Um, and those will be going on to YouTube. Um, but we're also having a live stream. So if you're sat currently in the auditorium and you're watching on the live uh, stream, if you want to click join now, you're more than welcome to kind of come and join the Zoom. So if there's any interactive sessions, um, then you can get involved and you can ask any questions and join the chat function as well. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to hand over to our guest speaker. So we have Alan Cross, the European Space Agency Business Applications Ambassador. That's quite a mouthful to say, Alan. <laughs> um, and he's going to be doing a brilliant talk on it's not rocket science. So I'm delighted to hand over to Alan if you want to make a start. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I um, hope you're all comfortable. It's rather hot where I am. I hope it's not too bad where you are. Um, I'll give myself a brief introduction just so you know who's talking at you. Um, my name is Alan Cross and I'm European Space Agency um, Business Applications Regional Ambassador for Northwest England and North Wales, part of a national network, in fact, part of a Europe-wide network um, that stretches from Ireland all the way to Eastern Europe. Um, my job is to help businesses understand the capabilities of satellites and the data they provide and help you help them along the way in, in, in applying for funding. Please, if you think this has got nothing to do with you, if you if you think space is something that the Americans or the Russians do, please stick with it because this is about you. 70% of the space economy, which is in Britain worth 16.4 billion pounds, is actually the use of the data generated from space. It is how that data is implemented into the non-space sectors for products and services. So if you are in the digital sector, if you are supplying services using digital technologies, you need to listen to this because space is an enormous opportunity for you. So I'm based um, in the Liverpool city region at a place called Darsby, which you can see um, on there. That's SciTech Darsby. I'm part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. That's a national research council. They host me regionally. Um, the site, I'll tell you, is a, is, is a wonderful site, major national science infrastructure, uh, very close to Liverpool and Manchester, uh, Chess, Cheshire, and even, even for Preston in, in Lancashire. Um, we're home to the Hartree National Centre for Digital Innovation. This is one of the most powerful supercomputers in the country. And it's just received, the, well, it's about to receive a £210 million pound investment. Um, it can do in 10 minutes what it would take your computer 15 years to do. Um, and they work, this is not just space, they work across sectors. This is a government owned facility, but it is aimed squarely at research and academia. It is for use by people in this country to um, create new services, to figure new things out, to get things moving. So that's who I am, that's where I'm based. What do I mean when I talk about space? Well, I'm not talking about rockets. Um, I'm not talking about astronauts, I'm not talking about the return to the moon or onwards to Mars or Elon Musk or any of these things. I'm talking about satellites. I'm talking about satellite positioning, navigation timing, satellite connectivity and satellite imagery. I'm going to give, I won't go into too much detail because that's easy to do, but I will give a rundown, a very high level rundown of, of what these technologies are and, and, what, and what backs them up. So satellite PNT, position and navigation timing, known as Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS. There's lots of acronyms in here, but I won't just throw them at you. I will explain what I'm talking about. The most famous GNSS is GPS, the Global Positioning System. That's an American system. Um, but you also have GLONASS, which is Russian, and Galileo, which is European, Baidu, which is Chinese. And then there are other regional um, efforts coming online, including, we hope, in the coming years, um, one for the UK. Basically, these satellites are big atomic blocks in space, and they sit about 20,000 kilometers out in space, and they just send very accurate timing signals telling you what time it is and where they are. And your device then picks up uh, at least four of these signals, and it can calculate where it is on the surface of the globe. Now, traditionally, this will give you a um, five meter accuracy of their advance. When Galileo is fully ramped up, and um, hopefully some point this year, we'll be looking potentially at one meter accuracy, maybe even in circumstances as low as 20 centimeters. 
Um, so if, like me, you live in a city which has these little e-scooters that you can rent out, these are geolocated, so you can't go into shopping centres and various places, and they slow down if you're on certain streets. Um, but people still ride them on the pavement, even though that's illegal. With 20 centimetre accuracy geolocation, um, you could tell, is the scooter on the road, is it on the pavement, and you can slow down, shut it off automatically. So these are just one example of how you might use that. But of course, the timing signal itself is useful, as well as the route optimization and navigation, which we all use, you know. We order a pizza, we can see it arriving, something from, we order something off the internet, we can see it, the delivery driver's coming at us. Um, there's very useful um, applications of the timing signals on their own. For example, the national grid is timed um, in part by these timing signals from satellites. They need incredibly accurate timing to switch circuits so that things don't overload and blow up and you know, electricity get where it needs to be and so on and so forth. And it is atomically accurate timing that enables that. So this also has applications uh, for master clock synchronization, um, but also in blockchain. Um, for that integrity timestamp marker within the block, within the chain, timed to atomically accurate levels. So we're all familiar with um, the power of satellite position, navigation, timing, because we use it all the time. From the moment you wake up to the moment you arrive at work, if you're back in work, and then you interact with about 25 satellites in space. This is a main example of one. Also, satellite connectivity, the second pillar. Um, we're familiar with this because when we watch the news and we see an outside broadcast and they talk to someone on the other side of the world and it will often take the, a, a second or two lag in between one speaking and the other hearing. So this has been um, this has been a setback, frankly, for, for many, many years regarding satellite communications because these satellites, the reason why there's a lag is that these satellites are 36,000 kilometres away, nearly twice as high as the GPS satellites and the Galileo satellites. And all they do is they're a big old dish and they just point their dish back at, in our case, all of Europe. And it's what we call a bent pipe. So the signal comes up, it is received, and it's sent back down. And this allows you to communicate around the planet. What's happening now um, is rather than this bent pipe, this next generation of satellite connectivity is now coming online. Stuff like Starlink from Elon Musk's SpaceX, stuff like OneWeb which the British government owns a majority share in, but also smaller ones with focus on Internet of Things, like hyper astrocast, these sort, of, um, these sort of things. So these are mesh networks. So rather than just the thing coming up and down, these satellites are talking to each other around the globe, and they are much closer. They're between four and 700 miles away. And what that means, and this has been demonstrated by Starlink, is that they can deliver a high band broadband to really anywhere on air with crucially low latency so you don't get that time lag. so i'm sitting here at home in, in central liverpool um hardwired into the internet and i can expect about a 20 millisecond lag um, it used to be that satellite communications was two seconds you know, when it's now down to about 50 milliseconds and they're getting towards 20. So what is starting to happen now is we are seeing applications for healthcare and education in some of the most isolated parts of the, uh, of the planet. We see First Nations in the Americas using Starlink um, and another system in order to get real time healthcare from healthcare professionals elsewhere in the country for real time education, as we're all aware of over lockdown happened that we've been using Zoom and various platforms for. You can't do that uh, with traditional satellite connectivity. But now this new generation is online. So it's about global access to data and services. It's about backup for traditional terrestrial communications. Improved security and integrity as well. I have mentioned the high speed, low latency of it. But there are also dedicated IoT solutions. So not everyone needs to be transmitting megabytes or gigabytes of information. If you're trying to get data or, or your, your customers are trying to get data out of uh, an electricity pilot, out of the tag on a cow, out of a, a, a phone booth, out of a tent, whatever it might be, this is only kilobytes, kilobytes of information. And there are dedicated IoT satellites. And these things are small. When I say small, I mean this size. We used to, back in the day, you'd see someone talking about the new space telescope they were launching, the new satellite they were launching, and it was the size of a school bus. 
on the size of a lorry. And next to them on the desk would be a little model of, of, the, um, of the spacecraft. Now, the spacecraft is the size of that model. We just have lots and lots of them. Um, and so it's, we're able to do um, smaller, cheaper, more accessible data from them. So that's satellite connectivity. Satellite imagery, Earth observation. Um, this is what most people think about when we think about data from satellites. And we're slightly victims of Hollywood with this. And there are two examples here at opposite ends of the spectrum. The Simpsons, back in the late 90s, there was an episode in which Mr. Burns um, is accused of stealing a trillion dollar bill. And the CIA said, we've moved the satellite to see if we can spot it. But all we can tell you is that it's not on the roof. So that was one side of it. And the other side, of course, was the Will Smith film, um, Enemy of the State, in which they claimed in 1998, that satellites can read a newspaper over your shoulder from space or read um, a car registration number. That isn't the case. With optical imagery from satellites, you're talking about maximum at the moment, 30 centimeter resolution. What's that mean? Well, that means that every pixel in the image is 30 centimeters on a side. So that is not enough to recognize a face or read a newspaper. It is, however, enough to recognize a car, to tell a blue car from a red van. It's enough to spot cracks in a bridge. And of course, we don't just have optical, we have infrared and ultraviolet. And um, using these frequencies, we can tell the health of chlorophyll in a single tree anywhere in the world. Um, but then, of course, we have active Earth observation, like radar and LIDAR and, uh, and microwave altimetry, where we can spot millimeter changes in topography, where we can detect salinity of the soil, moisture index of the soil, where we can measure the height of the waves, we can measure the speed of the wind, we can measure uh, difference in aerosol layers throughout the atmosphere. Critically with Earth observation, what makes it really powerful is that the satellites keep on coming back. They have a, re a resolution in space, but they have a resolution in time, sometimes measured in a day or so. So if you need eyes on or your customers need eyes on on an asset, on infrastructure, on a farm, on a, a, a development in the city, if they need eyes on constantly, then they can do that regularly. They can change, detect as they go. On. So these are the three things we're talking about when we talk about space. And I'm going to give you now some examples of digital businesses, some of them very small SMEs that have used space to their advantage. These are not what you were expecting to talk about, but I'm about to now talk about a company that takes photographs of people running marathons. So A1 Media Productions, these are based in Lancashire, and um, they're an SME. And the issue that they face, in fact, that the entire sector globally faces in terms of um, sports event photography is that it takes a long time to get the photographs online. Imagine there's 10,000 people running a marathon and there's 100 photographers at every step of the way tick, 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 taking these photographs. Well, that's hundreds of thousands, even millions of, of HD photographs. And each one has to be a quality check. It has to be assigned to a runner and then it has to be uploaded. And that means that it takes the industry standard globally to 24 and 48 hours to get the, from when you finish the race to you able to get your photographs online um, or, or your loved ones to buy the photograph of you running as a gift. So AWOL we're using some really clever AI, really, really clever edge, edge AI right on site with them that was looking at um, quality control that was immediately assigning the pictures to the runners but the problem was they still had a huge amount of data to upload. And so um, they tried everything. They, they tried the mobile phone signal. That didn't, have, that didn't help. They tried going to local coffee shops. That didn't help. They tried paying local people. Could they plug into their Wi-Fi? It still didn't help. So they approached these business applications. I would chat to them. And I helped them apply for funding. And they've just completed a demonstration project now in which they integrated dedicated satellite connectivity into their system. And they are now the only company on Earth, and this is a lucrative sector, the only company on Earth that can offer their photographs to the paying customer, not in two days, but in 10 minutes. So a huge earthquake has just gone off in this sector. And now when I first spoke to them, they were like, well, five years, 10 years from now, we'd really like to be nipping at the heels of the big international players. Well, they've just leapfrogged those international players in, in two years. 
um, and they are now knocking on their door. So this is a great example of how a, a, a company using digital technologies driven by digital innovation was able to disrupt and grow by the use of space connectivity. Up next, healthcare company. This is Anywhere Care, again, based in Northwest England in Lancashire. So they have, um, their main product is this own phone, which you can see the gentleman using there. It's a big, uh, simple to use, a touchscreen phone. D very low functionality, deliberately, so that um, elderly or vulnerable users can use it with ease. And if I was to phone uh, the gentleman there, I'd, uh, what would happen is my face would appear on the phone, and you'd hear my voice saying, pick up the phone, it's Alan. And he'd go with me, touch it, and it answers. It's as simple as that. What they wanted to do was to build in a service offer based around the phone um, on, on a sliding scale um, that could be bespoke but chosen by the users and their loved ones. So they used geofencing um, with this global navigation satellite systems and fall protection. So what that means is, let's say my granddad was um, every Monday he at nine o'clock he goes to the pharmacist and then he goes to the vet and shop and then he goes to church. If he doesn't do one of those things, I can be alerted. I can be alerted if, if he's suddenly in the middle of a, of a road or close to a road or close to a canal or a river or somewhere that we've agreed that maybe shouldn't be going because it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation for him. And so this is a non-invasive monitoring service that has been built around this existing functionality on this own phone product to enable a uh, peace of mind for loved ones um, and for the users as well. Um, and and it, it, I said, there's a range of, of functionality there, right the way through to predictive features, being able to, um, to look ahead and, 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 and use an AI to, to make a predictive modeling. And um, so this, is, this has helped many, many people live more independent lives for longer. Uh, next is, this is Orbital Witness. So this is used in the uh, financial sector, uh, insurance, uh, property development. So this is the use of Earth observation. So this product allows instant property insight. So we're talking here, high resolution optical imagery. As I mentioned, that's a meter down to about 30 centimeters. So each pixel you see there on the screen, if you're getting close, is going to be about 30 centimeters on the side. The power of this is because the satellites go over and over and over, you can build up an image, you can build up a time sequence of what's happening. And if you look at the bottom of, of that screenshot there, you'll see that that is a sliding scale that's going from September 2009 right through to, to when the picture was taken about three years ago. So what this enables, it enables the legal sector, the insurance sector, the property sector, um, to check all kinds of parameters, to check uh, on uh, boundary disputes. It allows them to check, is there any illegal building going on? And it can red flag problems early, automatically. As soon as a change is detected, the user can be alerted. And it, if someone is buying a site or to develop property or buying a building, whatever it might be, the due diligence, the due diligence that they have to do can be accelerated and enhanced because suddenly when they go out and check the site, that's one thing, but now they can look back at the site over a period of years. What's changed? What's happened there? Um, and of course, this has got excellent applications for, um, for insurance inquiries, and it reduces the cost of, of, of running these inquiries. And this is also used and trusted on the market by the likes of m &S, by Transport for London, by Slaughter and May, just to name a few. So these are three examples um, of, of innovative businesses using this digital technology. And you'll notice that, um, with the exception maybe of Robert Witness, the core of it is not the it's not the satellites. The satellites are bringing value to the service. So that's don't please don't think that this is just about what can the satellite do. So using the existing applications, the existing capability, and applying it to your sector, to your customer sector. So let's move on and let's look at a few other applications. So. Of course, we've got tracking of deliveries and assets and supply chains. We know this with ride hailing um, applications like Uber. Um, to push it further, this is applied or will be applied to autonomous vehicles. It's all well and good an autonomous vehicle running around a university campus or a, an airport. 
But what about when they're in the Lake District or, or, or the Highlands of Scotland where the mobile phone signal just doesn't exist? How, how do you get data in and out? How do you know where the assets are? Speaking of remote areas, look at what three words. If you're not using what three words, I would recommend you do. It splits the entire planet into a three meter cube and gives it three unique identifier words. And this is used um, if, if you phone search and rescue, they will normally ask you for what, what three words, where, where the person, where you are. Again, this is used by integrating satellite data. Of course, weather. Um, and not just the weather as we see um, on, on the news, but hyper-localized weather. Um, if you've got infrared that can see down to the decimeter levels, then you can have hyper-local weather forecasts for, um, for building sites, for power plants, for individual streets on a building, for hospitals. There's a, an enormous application there for these um, very bespoke weather products. Command and control, get the data in and out of a, of a major incident or of a major event, not for use by, of course, the emergency services, but also by others. Killing two birds with one stone here, drones and agriculture. So of course, there are massive agri-tech applications here. We can detect changes in chlorophyll and how effective chlorophyll is being at doing its job. We can detect that from space down to individual tree levels. Um, so. We can set up, separate fields out into individual segments a few meters across and, be, and check the health of the plant, the salinity of the soil, the moisture index, all these aerosols in the air, all these things. But of course, drones are really important. Um, most drones, um, not the really, really affordable ones, but slightly higher than that, will be geolocated. So the moment they lose a signal, they return to where they took off from. But then, how do we get data in and out? Once we're looking at beyond line of sight drones, how is the data transmitted? Um, and of course, drones can be used in conjunction with satellites. If you have a thousand acre farm or your, or your customers or your users do, yes, they can be flying a drone up and down all day long, but it's probably much more efficient to use the satellites to look at the farm and identify the certain spot where the drone should go to and the drone can then do those closer examinations. Telemedicine. Um, as we've learned during the pandemic, the use of Zoom to connect to prepared health professionals has been incredibly useful. But that's all well and good if you're sat in a hard wired internet um, area. If you're not, if you are in the Highlands of Scotland or, or, or the, the steppes of Russia or the Amazon rainforest, how can people connect to healthcare, to education? Satellite connectivity can do that. We've seen um, checking um, specific locations, so disaster management, city management looking at property, looking at developments, um, all these can be, can be enhanced with use of satellites. Climate change, um, how, do we how do we measure carbon sequestration? How do we make sure that businesses aren't illegally dumping? There's a huge amount that can be done and actually is being done using satellite data, but there will be commercial applications here that haven't been thought of. FinTech, we've touched on that, the use of uh, blockchain, integration. Now this is a still from a high definition um, video from space. So what we're looking at here, um, and you'll see you can't read a newspaper with that screen, but if you were to zoom in on the bottom, uh, the bottom left there, you can see individual ships, you can tell which boat is which, you can see, you could tell if there were problems on the bridge, if there was a crash, if there was an enormous amount of data just in that case of that and of course once you bring in uh, infrared, ultraviolet, radar. There's lots of other uh, information that can be gleaned. Going up slightly, but let's just keep going, shall we? And uh, these guys are on the space station there. And um, we know that on the space station, when we grow crystals, for example, they are much purer. And that means that medicines grown in space are much more efficient. On the left, that crystal was grown in zero gravity and microgravity on the space station. And on the right, the exact same conditions, but in gravity. So uh, insulin grown on the space station is around four times more effective uh, than insulin grown on Earth. Uh, fiber optic cables grown in zero gravity can carry 10 times the data that their Earth grown counterparts can. And as launch costs continue to drop, this is going to become more and more commercially viable. But I digress. I've given you an awful lot of information there all at once. And as has been said in science fiction many times, don't panic because you're not alone. Um, 
I'm here to help, not just me, but many of us. So I'm going to give now a very quick whistle stop talk of the funding and support that um, ESA business applications can offer. So we're a funding stream. Um, we're not an R&D stream. We are here to help get services that have got a minimum viable product to market. And we do that by funding feasibility studies and dem demonstration projects. Um, feasibility studies are not technical feasibility studies. They are commercial feasibility studies. Who's going to pay for them? Do they really want it? Is this just a cool idea you've had that works, but no one needs to use the service? All these things, trying to figure that stuff out. So we look for a market demand, not a technology push. We are focused on business and sales deployment. You need to be working in close partnership with users and customers. And potentially we can help connect you to those users and customers. It's about creating reliable, integrated, sustainable services. This is not a grant to grant chase. This is this will be the last bit of funding you ever apply for because after this, the customers pay for it. Um, I should probably note that this is not um, not a grant fund. This is not um, public sector funding. This is classed as a commercial contract with the European Space Agency. So here's some of the opportunities we currently have, as well as having these um, competitive competitions open at the moment. These are space for resilient utilities, um, aviation safety, tourism, the hydro sector, future hospitals, Schools of tomorrow, smart and uncrewed shipping. Um, these are specific competitive calls. We also have more open calls that last a bit longer. That's space for rail, space for uh, space systems for security and safety, and the open call. Now, the open call is very interesting because it basically means if you have an idea for a service that is using satellites in some way that is aimed at a customer, tell us. You tell us your idea and we'll consider funding 50% of that feasibility study or demonstration project to get it to market. So this is non-competitive. You are competing only with yourself. So come speak to me and we can try and move this forward. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what the, uh, the process of applying for this specific open call is. So the first stage is something called the Activity Pitch Questionnaire, the APQ. My job is to help with this APQ. This is um, eight pages, lean and mean, capture your idea, submit it to the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency, and then they will then consider it. And, and they'll invite you in to talk about it if they like it. And then um, after that, hopefully you'll be invited to an outline proposal. This is now working with a technical officer from within the European Space Agency through to a full proposal and then to project sign up and you begin that project. In terms of timelines, this is what we're expecting. This is in months. So first of all, come and speak to me, your friendly neighborhood space ambassador, um, and we'll try and see what we can do to help. Um, then there's the activity pitch questionnaire. Again, my job is to help you with that, to go through it line by line, to get it as lean and mean as we can. So it, is, it hits right the nail on the head as it arrives with those assessors. Um, then the face-to-face -face pitch. And um, this is uh, three months after we first engage with each other. Then if they like it, you go into ESA with the technical officer, outline proposal, full proposal, and a contract award after about nine months. There are ways to accelerate this. And um, once you've had your APQ accepted, um, you could then, I would say, you should then be looking at the outline proposal and seeing how those sections of the APQ can be expanded to fit in to the outline proposal, just to get through it as quickly as possible. If you don't engage after being invited for the outline proposal, if you don't engage for a few months, then uh, you will automatically fall out of the program. But if you come straight back with the outline proposal, working with the TO, you can move this along quite quickly. So where are you in your thinking? Um, if you have an idea of how maybe could space do this, could we, could we use it to do that? Come and speak to me. How did you come up with the idea? Do you have an end user who could use it? Or is this just something you think is really snazzy? Um, we need you to be thinking it from the customer's perspective. What's innovative? So what's innovative is not the space technology. We do not want you to reinvent GPS. We do not want you to reinvent satellite communications or air observation. What we want you to do is to take existing systems and use them in an innovative way 
in the sector that you're servicing. So what is the asset? You're going to need to know about what the space assets can do. Um, and I can help with that. Do come and speak to me and I can and I can help point you in the right direction. Do our timelines fit you? You know, we are a multinational bureaucracy. Um, and sometimes it, things can take a while. So if you if you want funding next month to go to market in two months, this isn't the one for you. Um, as you say, it can be about nine months to get on contract. And then if you're looking at a feasibility study, that's a further six months to complete the project. If it's a demo project, it could be up to 18 months before the project is completed. Um, so how does that fit into your, into, into your timeline and your capacity to deliver this project? Um, and it has to be a very clearly defined project. We are not putting money into your business. Um, this is zero equity. You know, we don't want to own the business. We don't want the money back. This is a commercial project. We want you to grow and create more jobs, frankly. This is taxpayers' money that we're spending. So who's the competition? Figure that out. You know, if, is someone else doing it? Is this a crowded marketplace or is this brand new? Who knows? We need to look into that. We need to know that. And be realistic about how big your market's going to be. Just because the internet, if, you, if you're doing something in the railway sector, just because the international rail sector is worth X amount of billions doesn't mean that that is your addressable market. Um, so, so be honest with yourself and, our, and, and each other, and, and we'll help with that. Um, and does the prop proposition fit into your business strategy? Is this something that you are doing, or is it just something you think might be fun to do because you might be able to get some funding for it? This is about real-world applications that will really make a difference. Very quickly, on, um, on what that initial activity pitch questionnaire looks like. Four sections, eight pages, company background, who are you? What's your expertise? Do you have the expertise to create this project and carry it out and deliver it? If not, how are you managing that? Are you bringing in consultants? Is there a consortium partner? How are you doing that? Section two, the offer and the added value. Uh, what is the service? What will it be? What does space bring to it? What does the service give to the sector that isn't already there? Number three, target and impact. What's the project? What are you gonna do? What are the outcomes? It's a well-bounded project that have to be deliverable throughout. There has to be a definable outcome. What are they? For implementation and delivery, how are you going to do it? How will it look? Month one, month two, month three. What is a, an outline timeline for this? And it's the same format for feasibility and demonstration projects. And again, it has to be a well-founded, well-constructed project because that is what the European Space Agency is putting the money into. Not into the business, not into the technology, not into the product into that specific feasibility study or demo project. So what can you do to prepare? Talk to me. Come and talk to me. Register on EMITS, that's the ESA um, portal for engaging with external companies. And on there you'll find lots of information. There are business model canvas. Um, think about your idea, refine it. Explore the gaps in your knowledge. If, if space is brand new to you, come and speak to me. Um, I'll see what I can do to help. And there's lots of guidance notes on there and presentations to watch. Um, and you can actually go on our website, which I'll show you at the end, um, and review other projects that we funded. And they are searchable by the sector that they were in and the technology that was used. So that's a really useful tool to go in and um, either get inspiration or find out if other people are doing this, this idea that you are, that you've had. Um, and we run these APQ activity pitch question and surveys and workshops for myself and the other ambassadors dotted throughout the country. Critically, ask all the questions. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Come and ask me, come and speak to me. So remember, use the ambassador network. Don't just jump in. Um, and also don't shy away, use it, come and speak to us. Each application reviewed on a case by case basis. You are not in competition with the other people, with the other applicants. This is about you, it's about your project, your idea, and how good is it? Will it work? Will it be a well bounded project? So be clear on the innovation and, and what, what it's going to bring to your sector. Critically engage with the customers. You have to be talking to the customers to find out what they want. Bring them in. Bring them in as part of the consortium. If you're going to do a demonstration project, demonstrate it with a potential customer. And they'll, most of them will bite your hands off to do that. Um, management um, criteria can be found on our website there. Um, do read that. Do read what ESA expects, uh, the language that they expect you to use. Um, and think of your competitors as well. Understand the risks. 
And really think about it. This is not just about um, about getting money and trying to do a thing. This is about the return on investment for UK PRC. This is ultimately UK taxpayer money that is being spent. So what will it do? How many jobs will you create? Not just in your own business, but what will this allow the sector and the customers to do for yourselves? So I've got a little bit of time left. Yeah, I've got about four minutes left. So a quick summary. It's not rocket science. It's slightly misleading because um, there's a lot going on. There's been a huge amount of information I've just given you there. So remember, this is about satellite navigation positioning timing, satellite connectivity, satellite remote sensing. If this has sparked some ideas, come and speak to me, okay? And um, this is already being used, already being used. This is literally more than two thirds of the space sector is this stuff, is, is businesses using data from space to create new products and services that service non-space sectors. This is where the money is in the space sector. So if you are in the digital economy, this is definitely something you should be considering. And you are not alone. I'm here, other ambassadors are here. The UK Space Agency is there to help. The Satellite Applications Catapult is there to help. Funding and support is available. So if you've got a service that it, it, you know it works, you know exactly what resolution of Earth observation uh, data you need and in what, uh, what spectrum, you know exactly what you're doing. You know exactly where it's going to go. You know exactly who your customer is. You just need a bit of assistance getting it to market. Come and speak to me. Let's see how we can help. If you've just got an idea, if this has just sparked an idea, you think, well, actually, we were doing this. And could we use, actually, could we use satellite connectivity to do that instead of LoRaWAN or, 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 or 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, wherever it might be? Come and speak to me. Let's, let, let's, see, let's see what we can do. If you're just curious, if you're just curious to find out more, come and speak to me. I'm here to help. Um, there's been a huge amount of information that I've given you here, but businesses are growing using space data. They are the bulk of the space economy. And you can be too. Um, the chances are your competitors are already using space data in some way. So we can't really afford to hang around. Come and speak to me. Let's figure this out together. Here are my details. Thank you very much for your time. More information could be found out at business.isa.int, including um, that, that search function that allows us to look at all the different uh, previously funded uh, previously funded projects. There's more information on um, Earth observation data, how to access it, that sort of thing. Email me, follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, and let's ask the questions because um, Space means business and we need more space. Thank you very much. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Alan. That was so interesting. There's so much in there that you've just, majority of people have got no idea. Yeah, that's it's really, huge. really good. Yeah, absolutely. No, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for doing your talk. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if any questions came through. Um, no, there's been no, no questions. Happens. I think everyone's in the auditorium. Fine, so, um, yeah, what we will do, as we said, we'll share the recording with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously, if any questions come in off the back of it, we'll divert them through to you because you've got your stand. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. But thank yeah, you thank you so much. Feel thank free. You, so. you could dial off whenever you're ready and go and join your stand. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye now. Alan. Bye.